And now for one of my favorite topics, subduction zones and magmatic arcs. In this lecture, we'll cover the slab dip, a thermal parameter, which is the H times the rate, the effect on or of the overriding plate above the subducting slab, uh, subduction into the lower mantle and the phase changes that accompany that, thermal metamorphic structure and the fluids that are released from the slab, the mantle wedge structure, the magmatic arc, and the focus of this lecture is on the descending lithosphere and the mantle wedge. The next lecture on convergent margins will focus on the responses of the overriding plate. So subduction zones are the most important control on Earth's tectonics. They cause plates to move, the mid-ocean ridges to spread, uh, they're the dominant mode of mantle convection because mantle plumes are a second order feature. They maintain a chemical exchange between Earth's surface and the mantle. They're responsible for continental crust because some of what goes down comes back up. They create ore deposits, earthquakes, explosive volcanism. And arc trench systems are regions of new or magmatically transformed lithosphere in the hanging wall of the subduction zone. So let's look at uh, a cartoon of a subduction zone and the different features that we have. We have subducting lithosphere, which drags down isotherms. So we have cool lithosphere being taken down deep into the mantle. That mean depth of uh, the seismic zone that accompanies that subducting lithosphere is about 124 kilometers plus or minus 38. There are fluids that are driven off of the subducting lithosphere from dehydration reactions and from fluids that are carried down into the trench. Those fluids are what lower the melting temperature of the mantle wedge and generate basalt melts that are partial melts of mantle peridotite. And those lead to the development of a magmatic arc. In the overriding plate, we have the trench, which is this geomorphic feature right at the boundary between the subducting lithosphere and the overriding plate. There is a bend in the subducting slab, which is this trench high on the outboard side of the system. We have the forearc, which includes the forearc basin that develops and the accretionary prism of sediments scraped off the subducting slab. We have the magmatic front and the magmatic arc. And then behind the arc, we have often back arc basins that result from spreading when the subducting slab uh, rolls back and steepens that results in spreading in the back arc region. We also see convecting a cenosphere in this mantle wedge that brings hot mantle closer to the surface. The result of that convection will be some decompression melting. And the average distance between the trench and the volcanic arc is about 166 plus or minus 60 kilometers. There are some common misconceptions with regard to subduction zones and I want to discuss what's correct and then I'll, I'll show you what the misconceptions are. First, the slab density increases as subduction proceeds because of metamorphic transformations in the slab that are providing a gravitational pull for the slab. It is not correct that mantle motion drags the plate along. The mantle wedge circulates and refertilizes the melt zone within the mantle wedge. And it is not correct that the overriding mantle is a static feature. It's correct that fluids from the slab lower the mantle wedge solidus and cause melting. It is not correct 
that friction between the plates leads to melting or that the plate itself melts. The slab sinks at a steeper angle than the dip of the subduction zone because it's controlled by gravity and it's directed downwards. It's not correct that the plate descends into the mantle with the dip of the subduction zone. As with most tectonic features of Earth, the discussion of subduction zones is limited by what we currently know about them. Most subduction zones are circumpacific features. In the Eastern Pacific, it is mostly young, warm lithosphere that's subducting underneath North and South America. In the Western Pacific, it's mostly old, cold lithosphere that subducts under oceanic or accreted arc terrains. Some subduction zones dip steeply beneath continents or arcs, and others have a flatter profile and subduct at a shallow angle. The flat subduction is presumably caused by subduction of buoyant lithosphere, either because it's young and hot or because it has thicker than normal crust. This flat slab subduction will result in uh, a cold seismogenic crust with no active volcanism, and there's no mantle wedge and a cenosphere that inserts itself above the slab beneath the, the arc or the, the continental crust. In a steeply dipping subduction zone, we have warm aseismic crust, uh, an active volcanic arc, and all those processes that we just discussed in the mantle wedge uh, are present. There are both flat slab subduction and steep subduction beneath South America. And you can see where the steep subductions are because they occur beneath these volcanoes. The flat slabs are in these areas where there are no volcanoes. The flat slab regions can allow for more stress to build up between the plates. Flat slabs represent about 10% of subduction zones, but 40% of the magnitude 8 and greater earthquakes occur in these flat slab areas. Chilean type arcs subduct young, warm lithosphere at shallow dips and the whole system is under compression. We see a shallow trench, a shallow dip of the seismogenic zone that results in large compressional earthquakes, and we see back arc compression on the landward side of the system. So behind the Andes is a fold and thrust belt resulting from this compression. A Mariana type arc subducts old, cold, dense lithosphere, and the subduction zone is steeply dipping. There are no large compressional earthquakes. And in this kind of system, we have back arc extension that leads to basin formation. And we also have the mantle wedge and asthenosphere upwelling above the subducting slab and the generation of a volcanic arc. And it was back in 1979 that these two Japanese scientists popularized the idea that there are steeply dipping and shallowly dipping subduction zones that are related to the age of the slab or the temperature of that slab. However, recent attempts at statistical analysis of these subduction zones disagrees. Um, slab dip does not correlate well with the magnitude of slab pull the age of subducting lithosphere at the trench, the thermal regime of the subducting lithosphere, the convergence rate, or the subduction polarity, whether the subduction zone is pointing east or west. And does this imply that slab pool is not important in these systems? However, the low dip or a shallowly dipping subduction zone does correlate well with the continental upper plates, um, back arc compression, and advancing upper plates.
and steep dip correlates well with oceanic upper plates, back arc extension, and retreating upper plates. Now, do these correlations imply causation? Now, which is the controlling parameter, the, the dipping slab or the upper plate? The Pacific plate has been getting smaller, and if you look at this diagram on the right, you'll see the coastlines over the last 120 million years have migrated oceanward. This requires that there is trench rollback, and that comprises about 10 to 25 percent of the subduction rates. And this is occurring whether we have steep subduction on the western Pacific side or shallow subduction on, in the eastern Pacific. And generally, you'll see there's a correlation between subduction rate and the age of the subducting lithosphere. If slab dip doesn't correlate with slab pull, how about the depth of the subducting slab? These are seismic tomography images of subduction zones showing cold, dense, subducting slabs to different depths within the mantle. Some subduction zones extend from the surface to the core mantle boundary. Um, others may be only to the transition zone or the mid-mantle. Uh, perhaps young plates are thermally buoyant and thermally equilibrate rapidly and just don't sink very far. Just because some slabs penetrate to below 670 kilometers doesn't mean they all do. This is an example of different slabs and the depths to which they penetrate the mantle. With the Marianas extending down through the transition zone, Chile in the uppermost mantle. So the thermal parameter, which is the age times the rate, which equates to the length of the slab that's being subducted, is proportional to the depression of the isotherms within the slab. So old, cold, and fast slabs have more depressed isotherms, meaning that cool is taken down deeper into the mantle. There are some important transitions that take place along the way, including um, at 410 kilometers, the transition from olivine to spinel, that's going from the upper mantle to the transition zone. And then at the bottom of the transition zone, at 670 kilometers, the conversion of spinels to oxides. And those, those transitions, those transformations, are accompanied by volume decreases and density increases because of the increasing pressure. The new stable phases have denser structures and there are some kinetic controls on the rate of that transformation. So a metastable wedge of olivine could be carried down uh, deep into the transition zone beyond that 410 discontinuity. And that transformation can take place instantaneously where olivine goes to spinel. And as a result of this instantaneous transformation, you get very deep earthquakes. This is assuming that there's metastability and that the conversion doesn't take place at that 410 discontinuity where it should, but that there's some kinetic limitation that prevents that from happening. And then you get that sudden transformation when it does take place. Lithospheric age is important. Um, that, that thermal parameter is proportional to the depression of the isotherms within the slab. That controls the depth of the earthquakes, um, not necessarily the depth of the penetration of the slab. So again, um, here's the length of the seismic zone corresponding to this thermal parameter. So the faster, colder slabs have deeper seismic zones. All the subduction zones are colder than the surrounding mantle, and that thermal effect can last for a long time. Um, you can see these cold slabs down at the core mantle boundary in 
seismic tomography images. And these slabs can end up in a sort of slab graveyard down at the core mantle boundary after a delamination from a subducting slab or when the slab reaches that core mantle boundary. Let me tell you about some of the properties of the core mantle boundary in the D double prime layer. The D double prime layer is this, this pink layer on the, the left hand diagram that is a major boundary at 2,900 kilometers depth. It uh, varies between 200 and 300 kilometers thick at the base of the mantle. There is a major change in composition, temperature, and the seismic velocities across the core mantle boundary. In terms of the seismic velocities, look up here to the right. We have P wave velocities in red, the S wave velocities in blue, and density in green. Those all increase as you pass through the mantle to the core mantle boundary. At the core mantle boundary, there's a increase in density, P wave velocities drop, uh, S wave velocities go to zero as they pass into the liquid outer core, and temperatures jump about 1500 degrees as they pass into the D double prime layer. And notice also that the hotter parts of the mantle intersect the solidus at this level and so can generate partial melts. Um, and I'm thinking, you know, the beginnings of plumes at this level. If we look at some current models for the core mantle boundary in the D double prime layer, look to South Africa where there is a large hot low velocity zone and the root of a superplume versus Hawaii where there's a smaller low velocity zone that can also be a, a plume root and the Americas where we have a cold high velocity zone that is probably related to these cold downwelling subducting slabs. So as I said, all subduction zones are colder than the surrounding mantle. And these seismic tomography images show you those cold slabs. The injection of cold lithospheric material affects the mantle in a couple of ways. It cools the surrounding mantle and causes it to descend with the subducted lithosphere. And it releases water and fluid mobile elements that rise into the overlying mantle and cause it to melt. If we look at the thermal structure of subduction zones, you'll see that the coolest parts of the slab are in the upper part of the slab, and that that slab drags down the isotherms uh, into the mantle, and that we have inverted isotherms beneath the mantle wedge, and those isotherms are parallel to flow lines within the mantle. The temperature at that interface between the subducting slab and the mantle um, is about half of the mantle temperature. Japan's two subduction zones um, exemplify differences in the thermal structure. We have the Cretaceous seafloor subducted beneath northeastern Japan and Miocene sea floor subducted beneath southwestern Japan. Looking at the thermal structure of those two different subduction zones, we can see that in northeastern Japan, the Cretaceous lithosphere shows a, a cold, fast subducting plate and a large thermal parameter, whereas the Miocene lithosphere beneath southwestern Japan is warm and slow and has this very small thermal parameter. And that thermal structure controls the processes going on within the subduction zone. In northeastern Japan, we see the large thermal parameter. Basalt is transforming to eclogite and generating um, fluids that are entering the overriding mantle wedge that begin partially melting 
and generating um, the basalts that enter the, the crust above. And that's all taking place underneath the volcanic arc. Whereas in southwestern Japan, the basalt to eclogite transition is taking place distal from the volcanic front. And there may actually be some partial melting of the subducted crust to generate adakitic volcanism because of the higher temperatures in the subducted lithosphere. A viscous blanket grows as the cold slab sinks and the downward motion of the cold slab induces convection in the mantle wedge. Um, and cooling of that adjacent mantle makes the mantle more viscous. It's an order of magnitude increase of viscosity with every 100 degree decrease in temperatures for the mantle rheologies. And the more viscous mantle ar uh, around the sinking slab moves with it. So it, this convection is taking place there. Now getting the viscosity in the mantle correct is important for our modeling processes in the mantle wedge because it impacts the thermal structure. If we consider the temperature dependent viscosity, you'll see that it allows this nose of hot mantle to enter into the mantle wedge area. Whereas if you don't consider viscosity changes then you don't get that hot nose of mantle. So that's going to have an important role in partial melting and magmatism. For example, in this thermal model for Japan, uh, Peacock and Wong didn't achieve any melting um, despite the hot slab. So there must be uh, viscosity changes in the mantle wedge that are affecting that thermal structure. The paired metamorphic belts that we see in California and Japan reflect the contrasting thermal regimes that we have in the fore arc and the magmatic arc. For example, the high temperature, low pressure metamorphic rocks around the Sierra Nevada, uh, in the roof pendants, and in the Franciscan high pressure, low temperature belt of eclogites and blucius compared to the Abakama belt in Japan, which represents the, a similar high temperature, low pressure metamorphism um, paired with the high pressure, low temperature Semagawa belt that has blue schist and green schist facies rocks. And these high pressure, low temperature rocks that are represent subduction and exhumation within the subduction zone couldn't be preserved unless they're returned to the surface relatively rapidly after subduction, because otherwise they would start to thermally equilibrate and would be overprinted. Now, the deeper parts of subduction zones are dynamic chemical factories where elements are distilled from subducted materials and mixed with overlying mantle to generate new continental crust, and residues sink to the bottom of the mantle. So what are the most important controls on convergent margin magmatism? We've looked before at some causes of melting, including by lowering the, the melting temperature in the uh, mantle wedge by introducing water from dehydration reactions in the subducting slab. So that's appropriate sort of uh, mechanism for subduction zones. We can increase the mantle temperature by introducing a mantle plume and thus intersect the geotherm with the solidus for the mantle. And we can decompress the mantle by bringing a cenosphere closer to the surface. And that happens in mid-ocean ridges. Now, the concept of slab melting was very popular in the 1970s, but it fell out of favor. And that's a common misconception amongst uh, students still, that the subducting slab melts. And this idea was that there were a two-stage process where there was melting going out the ridge, melting happening again in subduction, and then enriching low-pressure and temperature melting components 
um, into the magmatic arcs. Today's conventional textbook wisdom is that dehydration reactions within the subducted lithosphere uh, releases water into the overlying mantle wedge and that progressively dehydrates the sinking slab. Um, but really there probably is a small component of, um, of melting of the slab, but certainly uh, the dehydration of the slab and the melting taking place in the overlying mantle wedge is the dominant source. So what are the effects of water on subduction zones? Water and hydrous minerals weaken the plate interface and permit subduction and plate tectonics to occur. Water lowers the melting temperature of the mantle and generates explosive arc magmas. Fluids released by slab dehydration promote brittle behavior and, and can trigger earthquakes. And the hydration structure, rheological structure, and thermal structure of subduction zones are strongly coupled. In warm subduction zones, water is liberated from the slab by metamorphic dehydration and possibly by the collapse of porosity in the upper crust. And the amount of water that's released is predicted to be small. If we look at a, a cold subduction zone, we'll see that the amount of water that is released into the mantle is low one or 200 milliliters of water per cubic meter per year. Now, adiabatic melting is also recognized as contributory. So the decompression within that mantle wedge is resulting in some of the magmatism that's taking place underneath the, the volcanic front because that nose of hot mantle is entering into that area from convection. So we're seeing three possible contributors to magmatism beneath these volcanic arcs. The dehydration reactions taking place in the slab that are driving off fluids that enter the mantle wedge and lower its melting temperature. We're seeing convection in the mantle wedge bringing a hot nose of mantle to higher levels and decompression melting is taking place and there may be a minor component of melting of the slab. Trenches are deeper than other crust of the same age. Here's a profile looking at depth in kilometers versus age of the ocean crust. And here's the same, similar profile for ocean trenches of the same age. So they're much deeper. The outer trench swell, or it's also called the outer rise, is where the subducting plate begins to be deformed before it dives down into the trench. You see these swells here for uh, the Mariana profile, and it bends up before it dives down. This outer rise um, puts a lot of stress on the crust, and normal faults in the outer trench slope release a lot of the bending stresses that build up. If we look at the thermal state and dehydration of the subducted slab and compare a, a cold slab and a hot slab, um, this cartoon shows the, the low side of the dehydration of serpentine. Uh, for a cold slab and a hot slab, that's controlled by the location of the 600 degree Celsius isotherm and upper plate seismicity is shown by these crosses. That last diagram didn't show much detail. This is somewhat better, showing uh, a warm subduction zone in southwestern Japan. You see the earthquake hypocenters in uh, the dots. You see uh, the isotherms in these gray lines and that they are depressed within the subduction zone and that they convect up into the mantle wedge. And this green box is an area where the dehydration loci for the metamorphose crust is located. And it's harder to see, but serpentinized mantle and dashed line. And what you see here is a single 
zone of seismicity, not a double Benioff zone, which is found in cold subduction zones. I'll show you that next. Location of seismicity correlates to these dehydration reactions. Here's a double Benioff zone in that cold northeastern Japan subduction zone. You see two lines of seismicity. Um, the upper plane seismicity is located along the dehydration loci of the crust and sediments. And the, the lower plane seismicity is located where serpentine dehydrates. That requires that it's subducting mantle that's serpentinized. These are the locations of double Benioff zones. And so we can assume that these are places where it's relatively cold crust that's being subducted. In this seismic image beneath northern Honshu in Japan, you'll see uh, the dots that are earthquake foci and these different numbered areas. So one is the location of partial melting. Uh, two is location of serpentine. Three areas where there's transformation of oceanic crust to blue schist. So rea metamorphic reactions that are increasing density of the, that crust. We see also uh, partially hydrated Harzbergite, so partially hydrated mantle, and then serpentine dehydration. So this is this double Benioff zone with the seismicity located where we have these dehydration reactions and density increasing reactions. This plot compares the amount of water found in glass inclusions at mid-ocean ridges and in volcanic arcs. And this is just to illustrate the importance of the water to melt generation and subduction zones. There is much more water uh, in those glasses than in the mid-ocean ridge basalts. Again, pointing to the dehydration reactions being a very important process in subduction zones. Metabasalt dehydration reactions are generally continuous reactions which are smeared out in pressure and temperature space. Uh, the transformation of metabasalts to, for instance, blue schist and eclogite release large amounts of water, increase the density of the rock and the subducting crust, and increase their seismic velocity. Here are two PT diagrams. The upper diagram simply shows the, um, the metamorphic facies fields and the dry and wet solidus and shows you the point where hornblen will also melt. When crust is subducted in warm subduction zones, it passes through green schist to epidote, blue schist to eclogite facies, and high pressure, low temperature isochemical transformation of basalt or gabbro to eclogite, which is dominantly garnet and clinopyroxene or amphocyte, occurs at about 50 kilometers depth. This provides the density drive for slab pole and the water to generate melts under the magmatic arcs. You see in a lower diagram the the gradients for um, Japan, for southern Mexico, Cascadia, and southwestern Japan. Here's a seismic velocity profile for central Oregon in the Cascadia arc. You see the thermal profile here with the subducting slab and the mantle wedge. And we're just looking at this small box. And what we're seeing is the Moho beneath the continental crust of North America, the subducting basaltic crust that is basaltic at the top and eclogitized lower down, and then we see a serpentinized mantle forearc. And during the subduction, there are multiple reactions taking place, including dehydration of chlorite, talc, serpentine, hornblend. At greater depths, uh, chlorotoid, lawsonite, fangite, 
those are all transforming to anhydrous phases and releasing their water. Look at a pressure temperature diagram in another kind of perspective. And this is plotted in the percentage of water in the rocks at each of these metamorphic um, grades. And you see at um, low pressures and temperatures, the rocks tend to have a few percent water, three, four percent water up to uh, seven percent water in the most hydrous rocks. And at higher pressure and temperature conditions in amphibolite facies and eclogite facies, we have just one or two percent water. That is because of the dehydration reactions that are taking place as the metamorphic grade increases in the rocks as they go down a subduction zone. If we look at a correlation between the seismicity and the phase transformations in this example from Japan, what you'll notice is that the dehydration reactions going on in the metabasalts are taking place higher up in the subduction zone than the reactions that are taking place at intermediate depths. And the important dehydration reactions at intermediate depths turn out to be the serpentine dehydration from the subducted mantle. So where does the water that's expelled from the subducting slab go? It can travel up dip along faults to the seafloor to the surface. It can be incorporated into the forearc crust, uh, incorporated into the forearc mantle, incorporated into arc magmas, or subducted past the volcanic arc. This is a good image to illustrate the metamorphic processes going on in that subducted slab and the water being driven off into the mantle wedge and that generate the partial melts in the mantle wedge that feed the volcanic arc. The forearc mantle is also being serpentinized in this process. So what are the consequences of serpentinizing the forearc mantle? Uh, a weak serpentinite can control the down dip limit of seismogenic zone and reduce the mechanical coupling between the slab and the wedge. The buoyancy will tend to isolate forearc wedge from the corner flow. And heating of hydrated forearc mantle, for example, in ridge subduction or post subduction, will release significant amounts of water. This shows some of these processes, including um, fluids being released in the forearc, serpentinization of the forearc mantle, dehydration of the subducting crust, and driving off the fluids to generate melts. An old subducted crust, so crust that is more than 40 million years old, doesn't melt, but it stimulates melting of the overriding mantle wedge. So these, this hot corner of mantle wedge is subject to decompression melting. So some key questions. Where is the arc magma generated and by what process? What's the pathway of the water through the mantle in arcs? What is mantle melt porosity and permeability and how is it transported? What's the, the depth extent of the magma production system? Is there deep slab dehydration? What is the mantle flow pattern in the wedge? Is it slab driven counterflow? Is it a long strike flow in 2D or 3D? The degree of spatial interaction between the arc and the back arc magma production regions. And we have several geophysical observables, including the PNS wave velocities, attenuation, velocity anisotropy, electrical conductivity that are resulting from the material properties like temperature, the melt content, the composition, how much water. If we look at some modeling 
of the effect of solid flow above a subducting slab on the water distribution and the melting at these subduction zones. What we see are a broad dehydration pulse that fluids rise by a buoyant porosity along grain edges and that produces a melt front that then rises buoyantly beneath the arc. And you see that here too where melting occurs where the hydrous fluids interact with hot mantle and the melting begins at the hottest parts of that nose of hot mantle. If we look at some geophysical data for the subduction zone beneath Nicaragua, we can see uh, subducting slabs in these images and low P wave velocities and high attenuation zones correspond to high temperatures and that we can see a narrow conduit of melt feeding the arc. That reflects very well what we saw in the models that showed that nose of high temperature mantle in the mantle wedge and this narrow zone of melt rising up beneath the arc. And so these cartoons that we're looking at uh, reflect very well what we get out of the modeling data and out of the geophysical data in terms of where the dehydration reactions are taking place. We can see the seismicity corresponds to that. We can see zones of high temperature in the mantle wedge and the narrow conduit of melt rising up to feed the volcanic arc. Now the arc magmatic crustal plumbing is poorly understood. We see the moho and convecting a cenospheric mantle beneath the arc. We see primary basaltic melts that pond at the base of the crust. We see dikes feeding magma chambers in the middle crust, water being driven off, the magmas differentiating and finally reaching the volcano. That cartoon looks very much like the velocity models we have for arcs that show P wave velocities that look like continental crust in the mid crust. And here, the average continental crustal velocities with the mid crust of the arcs corresponding to those average continental crust velocities. So these magmatic arcs really are the source of continental crust and process those primary basalt melts into more intermediate compositions that we find in the continental crust.